This is our Sunday School lesson for March the 5th, 2017. It is from our Faith Pathway publication, and this is lesson number one. It is also from unit number one, and it's entitled Perfect Love. Our devotional reading is Psalms number 40, verses 1 through 10. Also, background scripture is 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 19, which is also our printed passage. 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 19. And our key verse reads, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Our lesson's aims are to consider differences and similarities between God's love and human love, reflect on how God's perfect love cast out fear in human life, and demonstrate what it means to love others the way God loves you. As we uh, look at our lesson outline today, uh, the title itself uh, speaks volumes, uh, where it says, uh, Perfect Love. Uh, two things that, as believers and followers, we should aspire to. Uh, one of the first things we want to uh, identify is the word love itself. And we want to put it in its proper perspective. When we say the word love, it is not a noun. So therefore, it's not a person, place, or a thing. But when we mention the word love, it is a verb. It's a action word. It's something that needs to be demonstrated. Uh, it's something that we express through our deeds and our interactions with others. Which entails our attitude, our conduct, our state of mind as we engage with others. And as we go through our lesson, uh, it would be offered as a focus that we put ourselves first as we begin to address the expressions and the purpose of God's love and look at ourselves to see how does this apply to us. The first uh, beginning of our lesson starting at verse 7 is titled as God the source of love and we know this to be true because our Bible teaches us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God showed forth his love to us by sending his only begotten son as an example and an expression of his love for the world not just for a particular individual or a particular group, but his love for his creation, for the world. So therefore, we are instructed in 1 John, uh, beginning uh, the fourth chapter, starting at verse 7, and it says, Dear friends, and I'm reading from the NIV, and it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, 
for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He who was without sin became sin because of love. Now, we mentioned at the onset that love is a action word. It's not a noun. And uh, a very significant statement was made in our lesson in the commentary. And it says, God not only talked the talk, but he also walked the walk. And it has been said that talk won't do, but do will talk. And it's ex actually expressed upon us, impressed upon us, that we have to be more about the doing of God's love than we need to be about just the talking. Um, we are in a time, and, and in fact, there's never been a time that we should not have expressed the love, the true, sincere, and genuine love of God. And although we cannot match God's love, because God's love was a sacrificial, unconditional love, in that God showed forth his love unto us when we did not acknowledge God, when we had not accepted God. And so God demonstrated his love for mankind, for the world, even though the world had not accepted God. So in our uh, largest attempt, we many times fall short, but in, it is not a measure that we use uh, as a deterrent of since we can't uh, reach the magnitude of God's love, then it's senseless for us to try. No, that definitely is not the case. We don't use it as a example or use it as a means to justify why we should not even attempt. But we use it as a means to set forth a goal and a focus of what we are trying to accomplish. The things that we are trying to accomplish in this in this uh, matter is is that uh, in verse 11, it explains uh, through scripture and it says, dear friends, since God so loved us we also are to love one another. Now, this is key in the action expression of how we demonstrate to the world that we are sending out the love of God. As we said again, it's an action word. It's about what we're doing. And when we define how this is actually demonstrated. It should not be on what we consider is expression of God's love, but it should be in accordance with what scripture says, that this is how you show forth that you are my children. And it will be because of the way you demonstrate love one to another. So we want to look at scripture to actually define those actions that we should practice so that the world will see us and recognize that they are of God, that they are believers, they are followers of Christ. How do we know that? Because of how they interact with one another and how 
they interact not just with believers, but also with strangers. How they demonstrate their love of God towards people. How they uh, actually engage and show forth the love of God, not just to themselves, but to others as well. We would like to direct your attention to 1 Peter, the 4th chapter, uh, beginning at the 7th verse. And it's quite fitting uh, for this day and time. Uh, in fact, in the, the 17th verse of our lesson, it speaks of the day of judgment, that how as believers we should have confidence uh, even into the day of judgment. Uh, here in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter and starting at verse 7, it says, but the end of all things is at hand. Now, many people today, because of the tension and the frustration uh, that's uh, so prevalent in the world today, believe that we are very much nearing the end of the present order and the present devastation of evil and wickedness and so forth and so on in the world today. So it is the end of all things. But it goes further and it says, because of that, because of that awareness, because that we see the evil and we see corruption and we see the things that are so prevalent in the world today, then it defines for us how our action and how our behavior should be. So it says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. We don't just have to uh, approach people and tell them, about what their wrong is. Uh, many people are quite aware that they have problems, uh, but they're not looking for just the identity of their problem. They're looking for solutions to their problem. And what speaks louder than words is demonstration. That we not just quote uh, scriptures, to somewhat discount or discredit the character of the individuals. But we actually manifest what scripture says. And it says, above all things, have fervent love for one another. And this will cover a multitude of sins. Not that we uh, just beat people down verbally by uh, expounding upon them where they have erred and wrong, uh, that's a deterrent. It turns people away. But what we have to do is do what Christ did, reach out and supply the need that people have, uh, that we try to better their life. So as we are practicing it, it goes further and it tells us to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Uh, nothing upsets someone more when we are coming uh, with the mission that we're here to serve. We're here to try and uh, uh, answer some of the issues of your life. We're here to provide salvation to you. We're here to uh, bring to you a better way, but we do it and we're complaining while we're doing it. We're doing it, but we're frowning and groaning and we're grumbling in the process as though I really don't want to do this, but I'm just doing it as a way for me to put on my list of things accomplished or things done that I went out 
and I visited the sick. I went out and I spoke to the homeless. I went out and I uh, visited those that were locked behind the walls. But as I did it, my attitude, my, my demeanor, my outer expression said I really didn't want to do it. But I was just doing it as a means of fulfill, uh, facilitating the requirements of my following in Christ. Well, that doesn't serve for being fruitful. And it says, and each one has received a gift. Now, those that have received a gift, the gift is not ours to prosper from. Uh, sometimes we use God's gift as a means for us to prosper and a means for us to gain certain material wealth or recognition. But that's not the purpose that the gift is given. The gift is given that we would go out and serve the people because the gift is for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it says, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So it, it's giving us a directive. It's explaining to us, here is how you show forth this love that God has given unto you. Here is how people will see it manifest in you. They will be able to tell by the things that you do, the words that you speak, the deeds that you perform, the attitude and how you demonstrate that. This is what will distinguish us from just expressing our own personal love, but the love of Christ. There is a distinguishing difference between uh, our own individual expressions of love. Sometimes we do things under the guise of love, but it's always with the anticipation or the intention that as a result of this, I get something back. I'm going to get something in exchange. I'm doing this, but my motive behind it is, is that once I do this, you are in return have to do this. But we forget that the love that God demonstrated was unconditional. It wasn't given because of a expected return. It was given because love covered a multitude of sins. So it was not given with the anticipation of what I'm going to get in return. It was given because it was just out of the spirit of love, which was unconditional. Now, verse 12 says to us that no one has seen God. And this is uh, out of the book of John, the first chapter, verse uh, 18. But no one has seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now, our commentary gives us a uh, definition or explanation on the word complete. And it says that the word complete means to carry through to an intended purpose. The world cannot come to know God's love unless they see him fleshed out through us. So when we speak of God's love being made manifest in us and that this completes us, then it completes the intended purpose that God has by placing his love in us. And that intended purpose is to reconcile mankind back to God, back to its creator. 
And that is the intended and completed purpose is to reconcile humankind, to reconcile the world back to the one who created the world. Verse 13, and I'm still reading from the NIV. Now, verse 13 says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Now, when we speak of that, that we live in him and he in us and he has given us his spirit, we also want to identify how we know that the spirit is present. And when we look uh, at uh, the 8th chapter of Romans and the 16th verse, it says that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the spirit bears witness of the spirit. Now, when we talk about the expressions of the spirit, those things identify qualities and characteristics. And a couple of Sundays ago, we were speaking about upon the uh, different uh, fruits of the spirit uh, from the book Galatians, the fifth chapter and the 22nd verse. So again, we will lift these because there are so many things in this present day that are not worthy of being mentioned, not just several times, but are not worthy of being mentioned the first time. And so uh, for us to repeat things uh, that are worthy and are of a godly nature, we need to speak more about these things in order that we can reach a counterbalance with the evil that is spoken so repetitively in our society today. So here it says, now when we say, and the spirit bears witness of the spirit, well, here are those qualities and those characteristics. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. When these things are what the world sees in us, then they can automatically distinguish this against the other things which are the fruit of the flesh. That's the contrast. Those are the differences and the similarities uh, of human love and godly love is, is that when these things are practiced, it's not in our flesh, it's not in our human nature that we always are long suffering with one another. Sometimes uh, we can endure with someone for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, some of us go the extension and we may be able to endure a month. But you know, normally the flesh, the human content of our being tires. It gets weary. It becomes overwhelmed and overburdened. And therefore, we have to go to another dimension. We have to be in the spirit in order to equip us and in order to encourage us and in order to enable us to go beyond what the flesh chooses and to acquire a period or a mindset of long suffering. Uh, we're not always willing to be kind one to another, but when we denounce the flesh and adhere to the spirit, then we find that kindness is greater than hatred. It is greater than animosity. So 
These are the things that set us apart, that we are gentle with one another. And gentleness doesn't mean that we're weak. It doesn't mean that we are docile, that we're uh, easily manipulated. It simply means that we, through the Spirit, have developed the strength to have discipline over the things that the flesh wants to do, that we are gentle in our engagement with one another, that we have acquired self-control. So these are the things, the characteristics and the qualities that set us against or set us as a distinction against just human practice and more so of godly practice. Our uh, last portion of this text is titled God's Perfected Love. And this is verses 17 through 19. And it reads, this is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. We're not fearful. We're not worried, but we have confidence in this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he loved us first. Now, when it speaks of being fearful, uh, and it speaks of the day of judgment. Now we know that the day of judgment comes and there is a reward and then there is a punishment. And in Revelations, the 22nd chapter and the 12th first verse, it says, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Those that have been working in the vineyard of the Lord know and have the confidence that they will receive the reward of the Lord. But those who have not acknowledged Christ, those who have chosen not to accept Christ and not to accept the way of God, they are fearful of punishment, but not the believers who have lived and sacrificed and given of themselves to be vessels and instruments of God for the building of his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, as we close, we want to uh, acknowledge some contrast in terms of how love is actually uh, manifested and uh there could be no greater text to actually expound upon this. Uh, and this here is why those that are truly in God are not fearful. Because real love, genuine love, sacrificial love, unconditional love, it does not make you afraid, but it gives you confidence. It gives you comfort. It eases your mind. It offers peace to you. It, it, it provides uh, stability in your life. So here we want to look at the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And it's a familiar passage. And I just want to look at the things that it says concerning uh, love. And it says, I'm going to start it at the fourth verse. And it says, love suffers long and is kind. Uh, this here actually just somewhat commemorates what we said in Galatians 5 and 22. It says, love is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. So we find here then that those who say that they have the love of Christ, if they are not kind, if they are envious of one another, uh, if they are 
parading themselves about to be recognized, to be uh, identified. Uh, if they are pious, if they are arrogant, if they're puffed up, then we know this is human love. This is love of the flesh, but this is not the love of God. It says it does not have rudely. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will fail. They will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. But love is eternal. Love is enduring. So as we look at the expressions, as we look at the conduct, as we look at the demeanor, the outer appearance, let us judge this lesson. Unit one and lesson one. Perfect love. Let us look at that from the view of ourselves and allow the word of God to continue to work on us, to build us, to strengthen us, to make us the vessels that will be instruments in the work of God, building his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We hope that something that we have said has been of encouragement or has been a direction and has answered some questions that have possibly been placed upon our thoughts. And as always, it is our hope and our prayer that we will continue to be blessed with the endless and unlimited source of blessings of God upon each and every one under the sound of our voice. God bless you and God keep you.